Aloha and welcome. We are here for Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month, and this is our special webinar with some new guests that we haven't had before. I'm really excited about this one today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am your host, Franny Brewer, and I am the manager of the Big Island Invasive Species today. We also have Chelsea Arnott from the Hawaii Invasive Species Council, who is running our tech today. So she's hiding behind that uh, lehua blossom, but we can thank her for doing that. She's going to be taking care of the chat and all of the other things that um, are really important. She's also streaming live on the HISC YouTube channel. So if you are over there on the HISC YouTube channel, welcome. Um, today's webinar is a part of the Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month 2023. We have a really great lineup of webinars this week. Tomorrow, we're offering the next in our high Sam series on wildfire myths. Uh, Thursday evening, we're having a very special episode called Invasive Plant Sales in the Islands, What You Learn Will Shock You, where you'll hear from some of Hawaii's uh, botanists and invasive species specialists on the growing market of plant purchasing and the threat that people could unknowingly be bringing into the islands. Uh, then Friday at noon, we'll have Let's Talk About the Modern, about the Mongoose, Modern Biocontrol and Why We Need It. That's always a really uh, important subject with a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of myths. So I think that would be a great one for folks to tune into. Um, Going to be a panelist on that one. So I'm really excited and looking forward to that. You can find the registration links for all of these webinars and the rest of the webinars that are going to be offered this month on the HISC website. And Chelsea's going to go ahead and put that link into the chat so you can go and check out what's being offered this month, sign up for some of the ones that you want to see. And if you've missed any of the ones, if you get in there and you're like, oh, I missed that one. It was last week. Don't fret. All of the recordings are available on the HISC YouTube channel. And Chelsea's going to put that into the chat as well. So you can go over to YouTube. Uh, this webinar is going to be recorded. So if you find some really inf uh, good information that you want to share with other folks, a couple days, you can go on the HISC YouTube channel. It should be there by the end of the week. And you can share that YouTube link out. Um, so that will be available soon. You can just check back on that. Now, before I introduce our guests and we get into it, Chelsea's going to post a little poll. We would much appreciate it if you could answer just those few simple questions for us. And in the meantime, oh, the poll's blocking me. <laughs> and in the meantime, I'll cover a little housekeeping. Um, please go ahead and use the Q&A feature that Zoom has so kindly offered us to post your questions. You are welcome to post the questions during the presentation so you don't forget about them. They will be safe in there and we will definitely come back to them after our speakers have finished their presentations so that we can go through those questions and we will be passing them on to our presenters to give them the opportunity to answer. There will be plenty of time at the end um, for Q&A. Um, the subjects that we're going to cover today may be a little bit intense or uncomfortable for some folks and so we ask that you keep all questions and any discussion in the chat respectful um, of our guests' time. So as I mentioned, our High Sam theme this year is myth busters. But today we're not so much busting myths, uh, but we're exploring kind of a mystery. I admit that despite being in and around natural resources for more than 15 years now here in Hawaii, I knew of the existence of the Animal Industry Division at uh, HUA, but I actually had very little understanding of the functions. And just recently, I had the opportunity to connect with one of our guests here today about rabbits. And she told us about rabbit hemorrhagic disease, which I had never heard of. And learning about that was equal parts horrifying and fascinating. Um, but it's a really important disease that I was not familiar with. And I certainly did not know was already present here in Hawaii. Um, as invasive species professionals, Chelsea and I, we are regularly exposed and discussing and wondering and thinking about threats um, from invasive plant species and certainly some animal species. But this is really a different type of invasive species, and it requires a really different skill set and knowledge base. Um, animal borne diseases, these diseases threaten the health of our pets, our cattle industry, our animal industries, our wildlife, and even potentially our human health. So we thought this would just be a great opportunity for us um, to learn more and to share that uh, 
that time with you. So to introduce our two guests today, we have Dr. Kim Kazuma. She is the Deputy State Veterinarian with uh, Hawaii Department of Agriculture, Animal Industry Division. She was actually born and raised right here in Hawaii, and she got her undergrad in biology at UH Hilo. So my alma mater too, yay, go Vulcans. Um, she went on to get her doctor in veterinary medicine from Mississippi State, after which she practiced in private practice in South Georgia, uh, doing everything from large animal animals to small animals exclusively. Um, in 2001, she was deployed to the UK for the Foot and Mouth Task Force, and in 2003, the Newcastle's Disease Task Force. So she's really been on the front lines uh, with these animal diseases. Uh, lucky for us, she returned to Hawaii in 2007, and she worked at two small animal practices and taught at the UH Hilo College of Ag, Forestry, and Natural Resources Management for a while before she joined the Hawaii Department of Agriculture Animal Disease Control Branch for Hawaii Island, where she's been for the last 15 years. Um, she's also one of our state's foreign animal disease diagnosticians. Um, and sorry, <laughs> sorry, I, saw, I know you saw the poll thing there. It jumped up at me too. Um, and she attends trainings at the Plum Island Animal Disease Center, which is a federal biosafety level three laboratory uh, and the nation's premier defense against introduction of transboundary animal diseases. She's also trained at the USDA National Veterinary Service Laboratories in Ames, Iowa. So again, right on the front lines of preparedness in recognizing and responding to animal disease threats. We are so excited to welcome you here. Um, Dr. Kim Kazuma. Next, we have Dr. Raquel Wong, who also got her undergrad here in Hawaii from UH Manoa um, in animal science and also went to earn her doctor in veterinary medicine degree from Colorado State University. Like Kim, Raquel joined HUA Animal Industry Division Rabies Quarantine Branch after spending some time in private practice. She has spent over 20 years with this agency working in a variety of positions, improving skills in diagnostic veterinary medicine, as well as administration and management. Currently, she's with the veterinary laboratory, but she wears a lot of varied hats over there, as she also plays a key role in supporting all the branches throughout the division to fill any gaps that might arise in daily operations. And we all know, um, as state employees, that there are always gaps that have to be filled. So big job over there. And uh, Dr. Raquel Wong is going to be our first presenter today. So after that, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I know you're going to be sharing your screen. So whenever you're ready. All right. Well, hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity for letting us share a little bit about our agency. And I'm going to share my screen now. So if you could bear with me for just a second. In the wrong view. Zoom always has that little tricky thing <laughs> when you're trying to yeah, share. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Try this again. <laughs> okay, here we go. And yeah. Okay, great. We see it. All right. Okay. So, um, yes, as Franny mentioned, um, this is a great opportunity for you folks to get a little bit more familiar with some of the things that we do here at Animal Industry Division. Um, and the, when we do our job well, it's a good sign that you don't hear about these things that we're going to talk about. So um, we'll go into starting. Oops, and you know what? I realized that you're on my section. <laughs> I'm in your section. Hang on. Technical hang up. Hang on. Let's try this again. Because we were previewing our presentation to make sure that everything went perfectly and naturally it doesn't. <laughs> the nature of technology. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. All right. And it does not want to share the screen. All right, there we go. All right, there it is. That's the right one. Okay, it looks like something's coming through. There we go. Okay, there oh, we go. Okay. Now. There you go. Now I have the right screen. Okay, so um, 
what we're, where we're going to start is I'm just going to, so my part is going to be more about some of the background and some of the, what we do and how we relate to the rest of the state government agencies. And uh, then Kim is going to be going into much more of the interesting stuff, which is uh, in the in the field sort of functions that we do. So this is just a very brief summary of how we approach our different functional areas. And as it was mentioned earlier, the, it, it very much plays towards the interplay between the animal health, the human health, and the environment. And there is a concept uh, amongst the agencies called One Health. And that basically is looking at how those things function together and interact with each other. Because we well know that, you know, when we have to deal or respond to that something in one arena, even if it's like strictly in animal health, it probably does have repercussions in those other two areas. So we're going to kind of start with how the Department of Agriculture is set up. And this just to give a somewhat of an overview of how animal industry and our counterparts in plant industry uh, connect with each other. Uh, we do actually work very closely with our, with our counterparts in plant industry. And the primary area, or what this slide is going to demonstrate basically, is the different branches that are associated with these two divisions. Um, animal industry does have four branches within it. Um, there's the animal disease control branch, which focuses primarily on livestock and poultry industry, the rabies quarantine branch, which focuses on the movement of dogs and cats into the state. Uh, the veterinary laboratory is a diagnostic services branch, and that laboratory supports the other two branches. And then we do have the aquaculture and livestock support services. And that one is more in market development and commodity. And I believe in the next series of slides, we'll break it down a little bit more. Um, but first, as far as plant industry versus animal industry, um, the, way, the best way that I like to think about that interaction is the plant quarantine branch maintains what, um, these lists. And these lists have been around for many decades. And what it is, is they are the gatekeepers. So they are the branch that help to determine you know, what species of what species are allowed into the state. And when they are allowed into the state, does it require a permit? Are there additional safeguards that that commodity has to go through in order to enter into a state? And so these pictures here are just some idea of the types of animals that are coming into our state. And some of them are prohibited. And then some of them are conditionally approved. You know, things that you would see in a pet store or something like that, or our regular domestic species. So this is how the four branches within animal industry interact with each other. And as, again, as you can see, uh, disease response, uh, that is uh, one of our primary functional areas, um, disease or animal movement, that is a second primary functional area. And then finally, our commodity support services. So we're going to just go very quickly through commodity support. Um, they, they primarily operate to provide solutions for producers. They work at that interface between the buyers and the producers, and they help to find solutions to help producers become more efficient in their production system, either through use of technology or through use in, increasing the genetics within the production unit or the types of things of that nature. In addition, they go in the other direction as far as market development to make sure that that product has a market to it that it will accept and in the volume that needs to occur. Okay. So the first um, big primary function that we have is animal movement. So we're talking about the importation only really of the livestock species and poultry industry and the companion animals. We work very, very closely with our federal partners in the USDA. Um, there are two main areas in the USDA that we work closely with. The uh, first is veterinary services, which is basically like their field section, and then the import export services. And this is movement of animal commodities both into and out of the United States. Um, so when an animal moves 
either into the U.S. coming into the U.S. Uh, they have to first get okay from the federal government before they then can enter into our state. And here's just a snapshot of the, the number of animal imports that we are inspecting. And just keep in mind, there are eyes that are laid on each of these animals. So the largest segment, of course, is going to be poultry because we do import the Dale chicks for the um, hatchery industry. And then the other thing, the other big segment of time is taken up by the dogs and cats. So we are seeing upwards of you know, 20,000 of dogs and cats coming into our state in any given year. And it does fluctuate. But I also wanted to note that even during the pandemic, when the travel had slowed down, we still actually saw quite a, quite a uh, normal level of imports that were occurring during that time, surprisingly. One of the primary reasons, and I know Dr. Kazuma will talk probably a little bit more about this, um, that we have this inspection process and we have a series of safeguards uh, for animals to meet prior to entering our state is uh, the tip. So Hawaii has been blessed uh, with the, we only basically have two tick species in our state. We have the brown dog tick, uh, which is statewide, and then we have a livestock finest ear tick where we just occasionally get reports about once in a while this is primarily livestock. But the other types of ticks that you see here, um, such as the deer tick, which is very famous for being an efficient transmission point for Lyme disease, um, those types of ticks we do not see here in the state. And again, there are safeguards for animals that enter into our state, both when they, before they come in, as well as after they arrive to ensure that carriers of ticks, which are most commonly things like horses and dogs, <laughs> they're the most, they seem to be the ones that we catch the most. Uh, they are treated prior to entry and then also once they are here, or they have a long acting treatment that will prevent the entry of these types of ticks. As uh, the climate is changing and it is becoming, uh, sorry, the next slide. As the climate is changing and things are becoming a little bit warmer, uh, we're seeing, seeing these ticks move across the country and going northward and westward uh, as a result of it being warmer across the continental US. The next component of movement is making sure that these animals have unique identification. Um, for livestock, it's in this easily with ear tags. And so each of these tags have a unique number associated with that animal. It allows us to do disease traceback. And where that's important is once the animals enter, sometimes um, there are certain diseases that will not show up until several months or even years after the animal has been imported. And because it has a unique identifier associated with that animal, it makes it a lot more efficient for us to be able to know where trace that animal's journey back to the state of import and know who it got mixed with, um, where it may have gone within the state, and make appropriate action to, to see if we can judge what the extent of that outbreak is. And this kind of just highlights what I talked a little bit about safeguards. Um, so each of the species that we do regulate do have some type of isolation period once they do arrive into the state. Um, whether it's an on-farm isolation, that is good for the producers themselves, the owners of livestock, because they do not want to mix new imported animals with their resident animals. Um, and that is a hallmark of biosecurity. Just make sure you're not introducing disease into your resident animals. For the dogs and cats, there is a direct airport release. The safeguards that are present for that pre-arrival period are much more intense uh, than we do for some of the livestock. And when they don't meet those pre-arrival criteria, they are held at our animal quarantine station um, until such time as they do. Okay. So this is just to kind of give a highlight of some of the biosecurity tasks. And and just re-emphasize the things that we have talked a little bit about earlier. So again, safeguards before the animal even enters. Testing um, that will vary by species. And the involvement of the testing will vary by species. 
making sure that they each have some type of unique identifier that, again, if the yeast can manifest itself once the animal does arrive, you can trace that back to its point of origin as well as, and even if it comes from outside the state, um, that state may be interested in knowing when you recognize disease of high consequence because it could also be affecting their state as well. And then that, of course, kind of relates to together because then it becomes a national problem and USDA will get involved at that point. Three arrival health checks. So that is the inspection that usually a veterinarian will do prior to the animals entry into our state. So that's like a health certificate, that's most commonly what it's referred to, or a certificate of veterinary inspection. A animal official will actually you know, examine the animal, make sure it has it's healthy, it's clinically not showing any signs of infectious or contagious disease. Once the animal has arrived into our state, the staff will review the documentation, make sure it's a that match meets the import requirements in terms of statements that should be on the certificate of veterinary inspection um, or any additional documentation that's necessary. It matches the information there. It, you know, it says it's a brown cow, and on the paperwork it says it's a brown cow. Um, they also will go ahead and inspect the animals physically. And that is laying eyes on them, looking for any signs of clinical or contagious disease, as well as for exotic fish. And should that be recognized, that, you know, whatever actions need to be taken will be taken. And that can run the gamut. Anything from spot treating, for example, if you should find ticks, or actually refusing the shipment and having those animals return to their point of origin. And then, as I mentioned earlier, once they are in the state, there is um, isolation procedures for especially livestock who are going to be going to their farm, um, mainly to make sure that once they are there and they're not as stressed, sometimes that's one of the CDD that will manifest itself. And it is important for producers to remember that that's really safe to their resident animals, so they are not going to infect their resident animals, and they can also take appropriate action if they can see disease by contacting our office. Some species also require post-survival testing, and that's because we do know that there is a long lifetime between when an animal may be exposed to certain diseases and when it may actually um, manifest the disease. And so post-survival testing usually occurs about a month, anywhere from one month to 45 days after the animal exposed. And again, we uh, work very closely with our partners in USDA. Um, they help to you know, give guidance as far as what are critical diseases of concern and then how that sort of is circulating within the, the larger globe so that potentially if we recognize those types of symptoms, we would alert them and they can take appropriate action as well. Okay, the second thing or the, the other functional area that we spend a lot of time on is going to be disease response. <clears throat> so it makes sense. So uh, a lot of our time is spent in monitoring or watching for emerging threats. And this is just some of the threats that we are currently looking for on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, it goes hand in hand with that inspection process and those pre-arrival processes before the animals come in. Um, where the, the situation basically is um, animals will sort of manifest disease in very limited ways and where the veterinarian part of it comes involved is that being able to distinguish where something that sort of detrimental to the animal, but is something that is detrimental and has high consequence. So the inspection process is important for sort of going between that and then the follow-up with that with the disease response and investigation is also important for making sure we make that distinguish, distinction. So again, um, just a couple of things. Even influenza, which everyone's talking about the high prices of eggs um, due to a bird flu. So this threat has been going on since 2018 actually. And it's sort of, the producers on the mainland have gotten better, better at recognizing the the, the clinical signs associated with the disease and taking faster action. 
to stamp out. It is a disease that's foreign to the United States, meaning that we do not have it in our domestic flock. So they do stamp out anytime there is a threat to that disease. Um, unfortunately, it does lead to depopulation. The challenge with Asian influenza is that it is endemic. It occurs naturally in wild bird species, especially migrating birds. So it can be difficult to prevent it from coming into a premises. Uh, for Hawaii, we are very, again, it's blessed because two things. Number one, we're far, far away and we don't see a large number of migratory birds, especially waterfowl fowl that come into our state. Um, and then second is that it is a cold weather virus. It likes to stay in temperatures below 70 degrees. Um, so that's why we tend to hear about it during the winter months more so than in the summer months. The, the other one that we are watching closely is chicken swine fever, which is a disease swine only. It does not affect any other species. Uh, it was first detected in China, again, around that 2018 period. And it is in, the, in Asia. And Unfortunately, that might have a slide later, but it's a very efficient virus. So it moves very well on different methods. And one area that it moves on is in meat products. And because Hawaii has such a close relationship to China, or I'm sorry, to Asia, then those meat products potentially could be a problem if you have plant producers who do to slop or garbage. Um, even though it's cooked, potentially there's still an avenue for which that virus could enter into our local population. However, the Custom and Border Protection, they do an excellent job of detecting and preventing the entry of all foreign meat products, and they basically prohibit the entry of those types of fish. And then finally, as I mentioned before, the fish. So fish, as climate is changing and fish are moving westward and northward, um, they are becoming more likely to pick a ride on something that could come into our state. Okay, so, <clears throat> you know, they always ask us, well, what do you need? What, how can you make your, how can your job be better done? And really it comes down to things that, you know, a lot of programs need or a lot, a lot of agencies need. And that's basically, you know, having the facilities to ensure that both the animals are are safe as well as the humans that have to inspect them. So safe, secure facility, having that capability of being able to isolate those animals where we can take the time that's needed to assess and test and make sure we have a good idea of what we're dealing with and what potentially the impact is going to be. Field personnel, um, in addition to veterinary professionals, we have you know, we have a group of livestock inspectors who are key and veterinary submissions who are key in helping us recognize what is normal and what is abnormal, and then highlighting these things so that the veterinarians can then pull those out and take a closer look at what the situation is. And then access to resources. So even, you know, in addition to the inspection process, the disease response portion of it actually is a take a lot of resources because we're dealing with generally livestock um, and these are large animals. So there's a lot of manpower that's involved and just having equipment to be able to maneuver safely around the situation. So having that access to resources would be very helpful for the program. So just to highlight some of the different aspects of all that we do here, um, again, we cover all the domestic species for the import and the disease response. And we, every day, <laughs> it's an interesting situation as far as not quite sure what we're gonna see next, but it's just knowing that we have a great team that will respond when those things come up. And that concludes my portion of the discussion. So if Dr. Kazuma is ready, um, he can go ahead and start and I will mute myself at this point. Okay. Um, I'm Dr. Kim Kazuma. Most people just refer to me as Dr. Kim. Um, and I primarily um, am in charge of taking care of whatever happens on the Big Island um, because we have been short staffed for su such a 
you know, for such a time period. Um, I'm usually the one that winds up going to Kauai or helping out on Maui County or even Oahu sometimes. So we do kind of spread out like peanut butter and just real thin, and we kind of fill in gaps as we need. Fortunately, we just um, have two new hires. Um, we now have a new veterinary medical officer for Maui County, and that's going to be a huge help between um, um, uh, Dr. Aurora uh, Villarreal and um, the USDA VMOs that have now also uh, been hired. It's easing the workload for us um, in dealing with Molokai and their TB situation. So, okay, next slide. Okay, so what do I do on a typical day? Um, I'm in a, I'm out in the field, so I probably have the most interaction with producers, um, and I wear many hats when I go out there. Um, so one of the things we focus on will be program diseases like tuberculosis, swine brucellosis, pseudorabies, uh, uh, trichomoniasis. It's tritrichomoniasis or trick um, in cattle. Uh, I also am the last line of defense for imports. Um, I usually meet the plane every other week and inspect all the livestock coming off the plane um, at Pacific Airlift out in Kona. Um, I'll also meet the cruise ships or if a sailboat should pop up. And I've taken a dinghy out to Radio Bay when it was a little bit rough and was hoping that my uh, microchip scanner didn't go swimming because I came close to it. Um, we also participate in disease investigations. Our producers are out in the front lines and they're the first ones to say, hey, I'm not used to seeing this much death or disease or illness, or I'm seeing something strange. And I heard my friend down the road might be having the same issues because of our working relationships with the producers in all the different areas. Um, I mean, I've had the fortune to be here for 15 years, so I'm very familiar with a lot of the people in the industries and develop that trust. And um, they'll let us know, hey, something's not quite right. Can you check it out? And so we'll be able to assist them, um, especially knowing that our um, veterinarians um, on island, especially those that will deal with livestock, are very limited. Um, there is a distinct line. We don't practice veterinary medicine, uh, but we certainly are there to assist. Um, we also participate in disaster response and training, and that's something I'll get into in a little bit. And I do quite a bit of public outreach with um, producers, organizations, 4-H, FFA, um, groups like BISC. Uh, anyway, so um, we get involved in many different ways in the community. Um, and the biggest thing is having those working relationships with not only within our department, but with other departments, as well as the public. And knowing your backyard is so important especially if a disease, a foreign animal disease comes into the state, um, just from having eyes on the ground, boots on the ground, we kind of know where we're going to have to um, kind of focus our resources. And by having that relationship, um, hopefully it's not as traumatic where you have some stranger in a white tie vet going, hi, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Um, that can be kind of scary. So uh, we're very available easy to uh, reach. And that's part of the best part of my job is it's different every day. And I'm out in the field working with producers. Okay, next slide. So when it comes to program diseases, uh, I mentioned them. The, these are usually um, disease, uh, diseases that we manage with uh, a cooperative agreement with USDA. Uh, USDA kind of lets us know these are the diseases nationally that we're concerned about, and every state has a cooperative agreement for each of those diseases to help them address it. Um, we do swine testing for pseudorabies and brucellosis. We do see that, and occasionally it does spill over into our domestic pigs. Um, all our pigs here in Hawaii are infected, the wild pigs, um, there's a high percentage that carries both pseudorabies and or brucellosis. And whenever we have a break in disease in the domestics, there's almost always been a feral pig in the background. So we try and mitigate that interaction between the wild pigs and domestic pigs. Uh, here you can see a water buffalo. Yes, I have to TV test on that. And there's a TV test chart right off to the side. Um, 
it's interesting. It's not limited to your traditional livestock species. So it was interesting going out to test this uh, water buffalo. Fortunately, when I was in Georgia, I had some experience testing bison as well. And uh, let me tell you, you need special handling equipment. Cattle equipment won't cut it. Um, down towards the bottom, uh, there's some rectal tissue. We do live animal biopsies for our small ruminants, sheep and goats, uh, to check for scrapie. We have set minimums that we need to um, send samples in for USDA. Uh, it's very difficult to get goat samples here in Hawaii. So we wind up doing a lot of live animal testing. And right where you see those little dots on the bottom, that's where we do a little nip and tuck and take some tissue from there. Um, fortunately, Mother Nature didn't expect to have scissors in that area. So they do not have the nerves to feel cutting. And if anything, the goats just don't like being restrained more than anything else. Um, and then at the slaughterhouses, we do collect brain and OBEC samples. And scrapie is in the same family of diseases that causes mad cow in cattle. So that's why we monitor that. Um, and then, of course, here's this is not a van. This is the airplane. And um, it's been interesting flying back and forth on Mokulele. Great views. Um, and uh, it just tells you, you know, it, it's kind of tough to get out to Molokai sometimes, and sometimes it's tough to come back. So you kind of have to um, wing it as you go. So uh, that, that was very interesting. Um, if anybody's not flown Mukulele, they should try it. Unless they don't like flying, then don't. It's a <laughs> close-up view. Okay, for imports, um, again, uh, we talked a little bit about facilities and such, and this is one area that's really kind of sketch and lacking and kind of keeps me up at night. Um, you can see this is my inspection area. It's the middle of a gravel parking lot. And here you could see a horse that came off the plane that has some ulcers on its nose. Uh, there are certain diseases that pop up during the uh, on the mainland um, that we need to be aware of. And um, so when I see this, then I go ahead and run what's called a, a foreign animal a disease investigation. So in this case, um, we're looking for something called VS or vesicular stomatitis. Uh, reality though, this horse just kind of rubbed his nose on um, uh, some of the equipment that I think the cargo net, he was rubbing his nose on the cargo net or chewing on it on the plane when he flew in. But nonetheless, you don't assume, and we ran it and it came back negative. But this horse of course was obviously quarantined as well as the rest of the uh, animals on the flight. Um, you can see it, uh, some turtles sh showed up at UPS unexpectedly, so I went out to inspect them. Fortunately, they were okay. There were no ticks, and they all survived transport fairly well. And if you look to the far right, th this is a special breed of pig that somebody took five years trying to bring in, and those are Mangalitsa pigs. They actually have a wool fleece, and those are the breed of pigs that make those very expensive Italian hams that take like 10 years to cure and also can keep foot and mouth and African swine fever alive for that length of time in those sausages and hams. So um, that's something that we are very aware of. And that's why we have restrictions on meat imports coming in from other countries that have those diseases. So uh, this individual here decided that she was going to bring in stock from the mainland and start that kind of an operation here. And um, it was pretty interesting seeing these hairy pigs. Um, and then of course we have cattle. So obviously at the airport, there's no facilities. I'll have to follow the trailer to uh, usually the producer's um, facilities and then do my inspection there. So that kind of prolongs the inspection time, um, but it allows us to still get it done. Okay, next page. And here we are, again, we open up the mouth, uh, make sure there's no ulcers going on here. I think this was the horse that, yeah, you could see there's some uh, abrasions a little bit up on the lip there. That's that same horse that had the ulcers on the, on the nose. Um, again, uh, sometimes we have to uh, do necropsies, kind of like uh, forensics or CSI, and we're able to get samples and we're supported by our lab as well as our national lab. And so a lot of times we'll wind up splitting samples and we get the ball rolling here in Hawaii. Um, one of the challenging thing is if we run across something that looks like a foreign animal disease, we're all the way in Hawaii. And usually that happens on a holiday weekend 
And in worst case scenarios, we need to get samples out to Plum Island all the way out off of Long Island, New York uh, in less than 48 hours. You're really supposed to have it there in less than 24. Um, fortunately, that doesn't happen very often, but we do have a courier service if need be to get samples all the way out there. And then uh, the animals up at the top in the muddy area, um, that's a disease investigation. Um, excuse me, sorry about that. Let me stop, stop. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so in this particular case, uh, somebody was feeding slop and not cooking it and just throwing it on the ground. And you could see all the animals that were exposed to that. And that's a huge issue. And that just shows how uh, infected material, say from the slaughterhouse, that maybe a pig had brucellosis or pseudorabies because they do slaughter feral hogs. Somebody picks it up, throws it out for composting on their property, and they don't isolate the animals. And all these animals now are potentially exposed to those diseases. So we try and nip that in the bud when we find out about it. And then again, down at the very bottom, you can see that we're trained in picking up the right um, samples and getting them shipped off in a timely manner um, to help out, uh, especially for a rapid disease diagnosis. We also work with our state Department of Health. Uh, they are what's called a Nolan lab, and they're able to do some work for us as well, especially with avian influenza. Um, and they can also do foot and mouth testing as well, too. So, um, we have that in place for rapid diagnosis if need be. Okay, next slide. Disaster response. Here's the big one. Um, both lava eruptions, uh, Dr. Moniz and I, um, that's it. It was just us two, um, realized where this flow was coming. And I live in the Pune district. And I realized this area that's cleared down there, there's a lot of small farm holders that, don't have a lot of trailers. They don't have a way to evacuate their animals. And this lava flow was coming down. And so uh, we set up to um, help with evacuations and trying to uh, get these animals out to safety. We did have some quarantines in place for different diseases on island. So we processed those animals at our quarantine facility at Paneva, and then we sent them on to uh, safer pastures. And, um, and then the, the the one house that burned down, there's video of that. That was actually my friend's house and it was a 4-H family. So we were able to get their livestock out and uh, they're currently living in Kalapana now. And then this is the second lava flow and that happened much more quickly and involved much more agencies. Uh, we had ASPCA. Um, if you look at the little kipukas there, we actually had animals trapped. And so it was kind of all hands on deck. And we had to handle that evacuation a little bit differently. Uh, we have forest, we have wildfires here. Um, last year, I think Parker Ranch burned about 40,000 acres. And fortunately, they lost very, very few animals. And the cowboys were out there getting those animals out of the way, cutting fence, bulldozing. Um, so hurricane response, uh, tsunamis, you know, we, we, we're part of the emergency response system as well, too. Next slide. And of course, public outreach. Um, so again, we participate with 4-H. We go ahead and speak to the different clubs. Uh, we talk to them about what we do and then we volunteer and help um, make sure that the animals all have their ID, uh, ID tags in that need it. And we work with CTAR and Extension um, to make sure that they're also in compliance with any animal movements that go on. Next slide. And that's it, that's the end. So uh, I know that was really quick and dirty, uh, but if anybody has any questions, again, um, go for it. That was so great. Thank you so much. I, I feel like every time I talk to you folks, I personally learned so much new stuff. So I really appreciate you both being here uh, today. I'm gonna go ahead and let's see. Oh, I can't do it. Um, can you stop sharing the screen or? Oh, tell sure. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. <laughs> Just so people will be able to see your faces so we can uh, ask some questions. So go ahead and you can put your uh, questions in the Q&A box or if there's if you want to use the chat, that's fine as well. Um, but one of the first questions that we have um, 
somebody was asking, why is there no quarantine period for sheep or goats? So do you want to take that? Do you want to handle that, Kim, or you want me to take it? Oh, well, I guess I, I guess since you do a lot of the administration stuff, I mean, I'll, I, I'm a sheep and goat person, <laughs> but you kind of do the legal legislation, the policy, administrative okay. stuff. So we I can mean, both answer it, but if you want to go yeah. first. So at least from a from an administrative level or from a policy level, it just hasn't been something that the division has focused on. I think primarily just because sheep and goats don't carry some of the significant diseases that we care about in the other ruminant species like cattle. So that's probably why the rules are written by that. I will say that we are in the process of updating that chapter as we speak. So I think that there will be some additional safeguards that are gonna get added in the sheep and goat sector. Um, and yeah, and basically it's, they don't, again, they don't carry a lot of the diseases that we see. Um, and when we're regulating, we're regulating for diseases of high economic importance that would wipe out an industry. So a sheep that comes in with a cold, you know, um, the producers do, they also have to bear uh, uh, some role in biosecurity as, security as well. So when the animals come on in, um, what I usually do is I'll tell them, you know, keep an eye on them, keep them separate from your flock, see how they adjust. If any of them get sick, let us know. And then you can introduce them to your flock. There are diseases that aren't called program diseases, but that owners might want to uh, test for. Uh, for sheep and goats, you can think of diseases like CL or cheesy gland. Um, OPP and CAE, it's a virus that causes arthritis and progressive pneumonia over time. Uh, most sheep and goat owners are aware of that. And uh, as part of a pre-purchase exam, you can always ask the person that you're buying from to either have them tested or you can have them and then test them on your own or um, uh, uh, you can ask what their herd or flock status is or what are they doing. But those diseases are not being managed at a national level. Um, so it's more at a producer level. That's so interesting. Okay. You know, we do a lot of work with trying to help people prevent the spread of pests like little fire ants and some places, cokey, you know, um, slugs, things like that. And it's really funny to hear you make recommendations that we also make for you know, personal biosecurity, right? We talk about biosecurity for the whole island, but you guys are sort of saying the same thing we say about if, you know, you're getting plants, if you're getting potted plants or you're getting some new cuttings, um, quarantine that for a little bit from the rest of your garden and the rest of your yard, make sure, test it, make sure that you don't have fire ants, that there aren't things in there that you don't want. You know, it's really funny just to see how these practices are kind of universal for everything that you're trying to keep from coming in. And it sounds like that would be something I, I did used to have goats and I didn't do any of those things. So. Well, that's, that's the other point too, uh, is that not everybody manages their flocks the same way. There are people that buy and sell from everywhere or they'll grab something off the mountain. They don't have a, um, a herd health plan. And so we have to balance um, the economic reality and hardships of putting those testing regulations and quarantines on the importers or exporters against um, what most people do as well too. And so unless industry says, we don't wanna have these diseases, which are already here, ORF is one of them. It causes a scabby mouth. Um, I'd say uh, national studies say that about 40 to 50% of the sheep and goat flocks in the United States are positive for ORF. Does it cause a huge problem? If it's the first time your flock's getting it, yeah. If not, it occasionally pops up. Does it do a lot of damage? Usually not. Um, so again, we have to weigh the economic impact of our recommendations and burdens, and is it gonna really make a difference? Um, so yeah, I don't know if that makes sense to anybody, but um, again, uh, you're trying to regulate for the masses uh, I raise sheep. And as far as I, when I bring in animals, because I'm sinking so much into the genetics and my program, I make sure those animals are quarantined and tested. I have a closed herd. Nobody comes into my farm unless I do a biosecurity screen on them. 
But then again, I'm probably the top 5% of producers that actually do that. But should the state impose my health requirements to everybody else? Not necessarily in that situation. Yeah, I think that is really important weighing those things. Were you going to add something, Dr. Wood? I just wanted to add to um, along those lines, you know, some of the, well, at least for our duties and functions, you know, we're talking at an industry level. But the thing I realized I forgot to mention is that we actually also work very closely with the, the private practitioners, the veterinarians. They are also our boots on the ground for helping us recognize when there is significant disease out there. And they'll give us a call and you know, ask questions about you know, what they should do in certain situations or if it does require intervention. So we rely very heavily and speak to them pretty often with regards to some of these updates or disease updates that occur. Wow, it's great to know we have that that network. Um, I somebody had asked, and this is something that kind of you know sparked this whole discussion or this thought that we should have this, um, you know, because this is something I found really interesting. Someone's asking about rabbit hemorrhagic disease on Maui, which you know that was something that we had talked about, Kim. And you know, one of the reasons we came to that is because as the Big Island Invasive Species Committee, um, we're seeing a lot of reports of people letting their rabbits on the ground, which we know is against the law. You you know, for the protection of Hawaii's environment, we don't want to have rabbits rabbits loose because they're very destructive. You can look at Australia, look what happened with rabbits. But, you know, in our discussions with you, we found out it's, you know, beyond the idea of protecting the Hawaii environment, protecting the rabbit, keeping the rabbit off the ground. Can you, can you go into a little bit more about that? Yeah, rabbit hemorrhagic disease is, is highly infectious and pretty lethal to um, hares and rabbits, and that's it. So it's, just within those species. So we can't get it, but we can walk around and spread it. And this virus is very hardy. It can live out in the environment, on dust, on cages, in biofilm for over a year. And so um, the thing that's frustrating is in the United States, it seems to be popping up here and there. Well, where's it coming from? I mean, we're in the middle of the Pacific. These rabbits were here. They didn't travel. Owners didn't travel. How to get here? And so the part that's really kind of scary is um, viruses are a lot harder to keep out of the state than, say, bacteria. Um, and when you go and look at where our foods are being sourced, food sources, we import a lot of stuff from China and other places, and it is possible for those viruses to survive the milling process, be contaminated, and survive being on a boat for a week or two or a month, and um, then be fed to an animal. And then they just, out of the blue, it like drops out of the sky. So those are things that are really kind of scary. Um, there's a lot of research being done, uh, especially for swine. Um, if we ever get African swine fever here, it's like Ebola for pigs. And with the amount of feral pigs in the United States and Hawaii, when we get it, we'll never get rid of it. So we're going to have to manage it. And in China, they've lost over half of their swine supply. They've lost hundreds of millions of pigs. If not, I, has it gone up to the billion of dead no, pigs? No. But it, it's pretty high to the point where they are now uh, moving towards raising pigs indoors completely in like condominiums. Mm -hmm. And they have HEPA filters and they restrict people movement. The people have to stay on campus. They eat, they drink, they, they stay on this premise, not allowed to go to any other pig premise. And they have to shower in. The feed trucks are not allowed to come in or they'll make their own feed on site. And they're doing that to be contained because uh, China is one of the largest pork producers in the world. And they've lost so much. The demand is just through the roof. And so they're doing that to protect their pigs because it's out there. They're never going to be able to get rid of it. So now they have to kind of raise their pigs in a bubble to keep them safe. Wow. Yeah, that that's very frightening. <laughs> Whew. And knowing that like some of these things are already here, not, you know, the swine flu, but certainly like rabbit hem hemorrhagic disease, um, you know, knowing that it's already here and, and you know, we haven't on this island, I don't think anybody knows that, that it's already in Maui. Um, well, it, it's burnt out. Fortunately, we've, we've snuffed it out. We cleaned and disinfected. And that involved, unfortunately, it shocked me that people didn't know that it's illegal to have rabbits on the ground 
So they had a bunny play yard. It was called Bunnyland or Playland or, or Bunny Town. I forgot. And so I had to actually rake up all the droppings. And mind you, it's dusty. It's blowing. It's difficult to contain that. And you're going, I hope I'm not spreading it as I'm trying to clean and disinfect this area. And we had to soak it down with um, uh, disinfectant, Vircon. And um, the rabbits that were still healthy on that premise were quarantined for at least four months on that premise. But yeah. fortunately, it seems like we snuffed it out. Um, and in Hawaii, question. yeah, if it gets out so, into the wild population, I don't know how the state would feel about that because we do not have native species here um, that are hares. And the rabbits are a huge problem. And it was actually deliberately introduced in Australia to control them. So, again, another reason, keep your rabbits up off the ground. If they are on the ground, make sure they're indoors in your house, but do not get out so they can't dig. Just keep them up off the ground. Wow. Um, it's funny because there was a question here. Can diseases be used as a biocontrol for invasive animals? And it sounds like yes. cases, they absolutely are. Um, and if that... if are there, do you know of any that are proposed for Hawaii at this point for any invasive animals, any disease that, biocontrols that are being proposed? I don't know of any. I, I don't think that that would fly uh, mm -hmm. here because uh, there, I think it would be too controversial because once it's out, it's out. Mm -hmm. The genie's out of there. And then you worry about unintentional spillover to, you know, someone's 4-H rabbit in a hutch. Right. And so once it's out there, it's just like any other biocontrol. You have to study it for a long period of time, look at the feasibility, see any unintended consequences, just like releasing a lot of the um, biocontrol for fireweed or for strawberry guava. But in that case, you know, when we're testing for the for biocontrols for plants, we can sacrifice plants to the testing <laughs> process, whereas <laughs> there would be a lot of, uh, yeah, I think you're right, there'd be a lot of ethical concerns with deliberately introducing uh, Hawaiian livestock and animals to things to test. Uh, I think that's a different, whole different level. Um, very interesting. Um, if there are illegal imports, um, I'm guessing of animals, illegal pets, something like that, is that, that more plant quarantine or is that you guys, if somebody, let's say somebody has an illegal lizard or a snake or Ill Ill illegal mammal, does that fall under you? Do you know what happens with that? Um, plant quarantine. Plant quarantine. Interesting. Plant quarantine takes care of the illegal animal. If it's, you know, if it's a dog or a cat and, and we we find out about it, um, Usually we'll catch that at the airport through the ag declaration forms. But again, it just, I mean, we all know that no border is a hundred percent safe. They are porous, even though we have inspectors and safeguards in place. If there's enough desire, somebody can bring something in. Um, I know that as far as planes and vessels, the coast guard's kind of out there. Uh, but again, there is still potential uh, if somebody were to take a private sailboat to say YPO Valley and nobody, you know, you're supposed to be out there and be inspected, but if nobody shows up and then you come in, you know, it, it would have to be deliberate. Uh, we have a lot of private planes that fly into the Kona airport and other airports, especially around Ironman. Um, we have a shake that flies in all the time from different countries. So, uh, of course, we have plant quarantine staff there to meet them, uh, Customs and Border Patrol. Uh, but that's not to say that it's not impossible for somebody to slip through the cracks. Wow. Huh. Um, so let's see. Um, one last question. Um, this person has seen a movement to ban the live import and export of animals because of animal cruelty. Have you seen evidence of that, of animal cruelty with bringing in live animals um, like cows, <laughs> chickens when they could just this is kind of funny because it's the same question we have with a lot of our plant issues couldn't right. we just raise stuff here we already have a lot here we can raise things here why are we bringing them in and i think uh, I, 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 you know sort of looking at those pictures where you're trying to inspect animals right on the kona airport on the tarmac and the heat and and you know sort of if just you know you can kind of get a sense of like that traveling cannot be easy on these animals right well there's, there's, there's many reasons why. And in my case, I brought in registered Katahdin sheep from South Georgia. Why? 
because parasites are a huge problem here in Hawaii. And again, uh, you want your family tree to branch. You know, you, you take advantage of the genetics of from producers that are in an equally tough environment that have been doing it for many generations versus our limited gene pool here. And I wanted to bring in stock that would be that had a good head start to being able to survive in Pune without having to deworm them frequently because dewormers are losing their effectiveness. So I wanted to bring in the genetics. Another reason is people are moving here. Uh, I brought my guardian dogs over from the mainland. Again, it's rare to find guardian dogs here. I'm kind of tired of other people's dogs and pigs killing my livestock. So uh, there aren't very many kangles in the state. So I brought them in. Um, reason for animals going out would be it's more economically feasible to take the wean-offs to the mainland to be grown out where the feed is cheaper than it is to keep them here. So um, there's a lot of different reasons to move. And I, I totally understand. And I have brought animals in on the plane. I have inspected animals that have come in on the barge. And I can tell you what, some of those cows, I not to diss an airline, but the last time I flew United, when it was flying out of Hilo, I was by the toilet. You could, they, it was horrid. And I was crammed in there like a sardine <laughs> for this flight to the mainland. The, the toilet wasn't even cleaned. And I'm thinking those cows in these nice little boxes with sawdust that smells so good. The smell of sawdust is wonderful. And they're able to lay down, stand up, turn around, and they're able to take a direct flight from Kona and potentially be out in a feed yard in Texas within 12 hours. They'll, they're on the mainland in about five or six versus, you know, other, other methods of transport. And when you're spending that much money, it behooves, I mean, the producer wants to make sure those animals are taken well care of. And a lot of the ranchers that um, are the bigger ranchers that ship cattle out, they participate in uh, quality assurance programs, be it through um, Whole Foods or the different programs that they're in. And they actively uh, have um, animal welfare certifications. Um, they have follow through, they have inspections, they're audited. So they actually care about their animals. And I was looking at those cows going, I'd rather be a cow flying on Pacific Airlift than that United Airlines in the back seat, where it was <laughs> kind of gnarly and not even food. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I understand it, but no, the animals aren't packed in like there. We do care about it. And the industry has done a lot um, studying animals for any heat stress and other things. Our animals are adopted to that here. Um, but if you're going to send a cow from Wisconsin to, to uh, you know, we're in the middle of the snow and then bring it to the hot of Hawaii, yeah, there is a little bit more stress on that animal. But working with extension, um, sea tar, I mean, you know, we're all very familiar with Temple Grandin and her great work. Um, and we take it seriously because we care about these animals. And if we don't care about them, let's say we didn't even care about them. It will still hit us in the pocketbook if we don't care about them. And so even if you don't care, you have to care because it's just not right. And it's going to cost you in the end. So, but uh, yeah, these people, I know that these people really do care about their animals. Yeah. And it sounds like you guys do as well. You do a really amazing job and we're so grateful that you were both able to give us your time today for this webinar. I feel like we've learned a lot. We should ship ourselves if we're if flying United as cattle. So <laughs> Sounds like it'd be more comfortable. So that's a, that's a lesson learned. Um, is there, I don't know if you have ready ac uh, access. Oh, Chelsea put it up, uh, I think, uh, in the, I think she's going to put it up in there. Or if you guys have ready access, uh, is there a website where people can get more information, find out more about animal industry, something like that that we could share? Um, so we are, the best place to go would be the department's website. So it's HDOA. Hawaii.gov, and then there would be a banner that has, you could either click on um, the Animal Industry Division, or, and it's usually on the left-hand side of the, of the website itself. Oh, there you go. So, That's the website. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. 
<laughs> there. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and with that, we're going to wrap up and thank everyone who attended today for joining us and learning more about animal industry. And we so appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. <laughs> Great. Mahalo.